I'm a, probably a bit of an interloper here because I'm not actually going to talk about AMR. But what we are going to talk about is some of the studies that we've been doing and funding in terms of vaccines development and really reducing the, the, the load, really, in front of, um, of patients. There are several overlaps, so if you bear with me, hopefully you'll see where this fits in. Uh, my name's Mike Whelan. I'm an immunologist and a program manager for CEPI. And you've probably never heard of CEPI, but uh, we're the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. We were set up as a direct result, actually, of the Ebola crisis. And as you can see, we've got some fantastic um, sponsors here, including the Norwegian government, Wellcome Trust, Germany, the Gates Foundation, and thankfully we had uh, India and the UK joined us very recently, which we were delighted to hear. So what exactly are we? Well, we're a global coalition, public-private partnership, but we will stimulate the funding for emerging diseases. And basically, we come in where market forces have failed. So if it's not worth doing, we will say, look, you get paid anyway. Let's do it, because it's the right thing to do. We want to build capacity in the local areas. And we want to take vaccine candidates all the way through. So, but we'll probably stop at phase two. I'll come back to that in a second. We were actually originally set up in Davos in 2017. Bill Gates is in the middle. And Bill Gates basically said, OK, the world was very clever. You did Ebola in 18 months. Aren't you clever? Now do it faster and get ready to do it again. Because epidemics happen. This is likely to happen again. And so that's why we're called preparedness. In our vision, We'd like to see a world without epidemics. We'd like to be prepared for it. Is that going to happen? Probably not, but at least we can be ready for it. And that's what we're here. So we'll accelerate the development of vaccines against emerging diseases, which are largely ignored by the big pharma companies because there really isn't a market for it. So we want to have it ready for people. When there's an outbreak, we want to have it in the fridge. We open the fridge and say, there you go. So we want to be prepared, we want to have a response, but we also want to be sustainable, whether that be developing manufacturing, say, in endemic regions, or just being prepared. That's what it's all about. So our initial five-year funding was to take late-stage preclinical candidates through proof of concept. Then we'll do a phase one, usually probably in the West, and then we'll do a phase two in an endemic region. If the phase two is successful, we will then make a stockpile. What we probably won't do is bring it on into phase three, because that's not really what we're about. We want stuff that is safe and works and is ready to go. If somebody else wants to take it on, that's great. We'd rather spend our money covering as many diseases as we can. We're currently sitting, just for sake of argument, we're currently sitting on about $700 million, so we're just shy of a billion. So it's a very big fund, and our sponsors have been absolutely fantastic. Our priority pathogens that we work on are actually based on the WHO blueprint list, priority pathogen blueprint list. So currently, our first three products, uh, projects are based on MERS, Lassa, and NEPA. I'll explain what they are in a second. And we've just opened up a new call for chikungunya, which obviously is a major problem for India, <coughs> and Rift Valley fever. And you also see at the end we've got disease X. So we've actually done two calls. One call was developing against the first three priority pathogens because they're pretty high on the WHO list. And then what we wanted to do was develop technologies which could be used for anything, for the epidemic that will happen. We know it will happen. We want to be ready for it. So we wanted to develop technologies that could be used for anything. So our first call, CFP, call for proposal, call for proposal one was just in case vaccines for MERS, Lassa, and Nipah. 
And currently, although we only started this about 14 months ago, we now have 14 candidates under development, and in fact, we should have about 16 or 17 very soon. So we haven't been hanging about. We've had applications from academics, biotechs, large pharma, everybody really. So it's a broad diversity. Um, and what we do is we don't really call them grants. We call them investments. So we are not there to say, you did it wrong, we're going to shout at you. That doesn't help anybody. If something goes wrong, we'd rather bring somebody in and try and fix it. So we work together with our partners. And we think that's really important to our model. We've got proposals from all over the world, North America, Europe, Africa, Australia, Middle East, everywhere. Um, and we're still working. Then, in the second call for proposals, we call it just-in-time vaccines. And these weren't really about the disease. These were about the platform, Pathogen X. And you could imagine that actually the same platform may well be useful in AMR as well. So what we were doing here was trying to work out ways in which we could have a system ready, a bit like a sort of a plug-and-play system, that within 16 weeks of identifying the pathogen, we'd want to have material ready for a phase one. We'd want six weeks for clinical benefit, and within another six weeks, we'd want 100,000 doses. It's a very big ask. We currently have signed two deals in those these, and um, there's another one or two coming in the very near future, which I can't really tell you more about. But in this case, what we do is we're only sponsoring phase one trials. We just want to demonstrate the technology works. If somebody else wants to take it on and use it for something else, we'd be delighted to work with them. But it, the idea of having sort of two strings to our bow, if you like, we've got the disease-specific vaccines, and we've got the technology-specific vaccines. Well, technology non-specific vaccines, if you like. Then we've just actually released our third call for proposals, and this is within 14 months, so as I say, we, we've been quite busy. The closing date for this is actually the 26th of February, and then we're looking at Rift Valley Fever and Chikungunya. These two diseases are both on the WHO blueprint list, but they're actually quite different. Rift Valley is probably a lot earlier stage. Most of the candidates we're likely to get. We haven't seen the proposals, so I'm surmising here. But we think these are most likely to be late-stage preclinical, possibly phase one candidates. Chikungunya is more likely to be phase, late phase two and possibly even phase three candidates. Now, as I said to you before, CEPI doesn't really want to put all our money into doing a phase three study, but what we will do is we'll do phase three enabling studies. We want to make it easier for somebody to say, you know what, let's do the study. So we'll fund things like... Um, assay development, will fund things like epidemiology studies, all of those things that would just make, if you like, taking a bite out of the apple, just making that a little bit more appetizing for somebody to say, you know what, let's get this thing out there, because there's a clinical need for it. Chikungunya in particular, in the context of AMR, from what we've been hearing today, we know it's immunosuppressive, and it's a very debilitating disease. If we could reduce the disease burden, surely there's a role for us here. Of the partnership agreements we've already signed, we've probably spent in the last year roughly about $250 million. We've got a variety of candidates. We've got LASA, uh, MERS candidates. We've got uh, NEPA candidates. And you can see we've quite a lot of big players here, a lot of biotechs. We've got J&J &J involved, or Janssen involved with our Oxford project. And then we've also, in our CFP2 projects, we've got our colleagues over at Imperial who are doing a very interesting technology for rapid development of new platforms. And we've got a, an excellent group in Queensland, Australia. Again, looking at being able to take pretty much anything, dropping it into their system, and making recombinant protein vaccines. So it's a bit of both. So it's vaccine-specific, and there's platforms. Just to give you an idea of why this matters, any of these could have become epidemics. They could have got hopelessly out of control. If we look at, the, say, last year's Lassa fever outbreak, this happens every year. And to be honest, nobody <coughs> cares. And this is wrong. We think it's wrong. Of last year, there were over 144 deaths from Lassa fever, and this happens year in, year out. 
If this happened in Croydon, I think somebody would probably do something about it, don't you? The Ebola outbreak. Now, we weren't directly involved in Ebola. That was happening beforehand. But it is part of our constitution that we will help to finish the job, if you like. So we are currently in negotiations to sponsor two more clinical trials for some of the other vaccine candidates. We're not saying anybody's done anything wrong. We just want to give people more options. We know the WHO have been talking to us, and we know there's an urgent need. The current outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo is really quite terrifying. There are also 18 terrorist groups in the area, so it's very difficult to get it out there. I was at a meeting in Geneva recently, and they said, we don't need more vaccines, we need tanks. And I think that's terrifying. And also, the outbreak of Nipah, which is primarily found in... Malaysia. It's very similar to Hendra virus, which is in Australia. But this thing's carried by fruit bats, got to Kerala province in India. This was terrifying. The case fatality rate was 89%. This thing was all over within about 14 days, and it is terrifying. If that had got out of control, what we heard, our CEO went out there, and what he told us was that the medics on the ground were absolutely incredible. He said they identified it really, really quickly. If they hadn't, this could have got horribly out of control. And that's the most deadly outbreak of NEPA we've ever heard of. So I told you it wouldn't take you very long. I just wanted to tell you who we are and what we do. And uh, this was us in Norway last year where we're headquartered because the government of Norway put an awful lot of money in. I'm at the back hiding behind a Viking because it's really, really cold up there. Thank you. <laughs>